Today's episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the tool to use to make a website for your brand or business. More about them in just a bit. There was a time when Earth came perilously close to losing all life upon it. This mass extinction event was so devastating and happened so far in the past, 252 million years ago, that it's nearly impossible for us to contemplate. The greatest disaster to ever hit Earth happened long before humans existed. Indeed, there were no mammals at all. It was even many millions of years before the age of the dinosaurs. Yet, we can understand what happened despite the utterly vast expanse of time involved. The array of animals wiped out in massive numbers can seem tangible when we contemplate their fossilized skeletons and imagine how they must have looked roaming their ancient world. Some of those peculiar beasts, though, looked nothing like us. Thankfully so were our ancestors. Throughout the many millions of years these animals lived and diversified, some fascinating specimens came to roam the one giant continent at the time, Pangaea. Yet, the vast majority of all the species alive on Earth, by most accounts more than 90% of them, did not survive this colossal disaster. Fortunately for us, some plants and animals did survive, and they evolved to become the life forms we know today including ourselves. The Great Extinction Event is technically known as the Permian Extinction, or sometimes the Permian-Triassic Extinction, as it marks the boundary between two geologic periods, the Permian and the Triassic. It's commonly also known as the Great Dying. In the long back history of Earth, going back many millions of years, there have been five major extinction events. The one that has got the most attention, of course, was the cataclysm which ended the age of the dinosaurs. There are those who contend that we are in the midst of a sixth major extinction at present. Putting that terrifying prospect aside for the time being, the worldwide demise of the great lizards was the fifth and most recent extinction event on Earth. The one we're focusing on now was the third, occurring 252 million years ago. We know about this astoundingly deadly event from fossil evidence. There are layers of fossils from before the Great Dying which are filled with a wide variety of plants and animal species. The Permian period began as an ice age, but the ice caps melted and Earth warmed. By the end of the Permian, just before the Great Dying, the planet was lush and green. The plants and animals of the time could be considered primitive. Flowering plants would not appear for more than a hundred billion years, yet they had adapted to survive. There were enormous forests of ferns and seed ferns, conifers and small shrubs shrubs existed, seed plants began to dominate. As plant species spread across Pangaea, insects that depended upon them for food flourished. Some insects at the time were even capable of flight. In the oceans, sharks and bony fishes had developed. Other forms of sea life included sponges, corals, and ammonites, and they were widely dispersed. Brachiopods, marine invertebrates that live in shells such as the lingula, which live in mudflats, are fairly rare in the modern world, but they were quite common in the Permian. On land, species from insects to large four-legged beasts, you'll soon be hearing about some of our pre-mammalian ancestors, roamed across landscapes ranging from swamps to forests to arid deserts. Many of these species lived for millions of years, yet evidence of their continued existence is absent in later layers of rock. Something profound happened to cause all these varied forms of life to just disappear from the fossil record. It's widely accepted that an asteroid slamming into the Earth 66 million years ago doomed the dinosaurs. When that was established, it seemed possible that the mass extinction 186 million years earlier could have been caused by a similar event. Most scientists now dismiss the idea that an asteroid was responsible for the great dying, though. The idea of a much earlier asteroid may seem like it would be a convenient way to explain the evidence in the fossil record, but there simply isn't any evidence for an asteroid strike that would coincide with a mass extinction 252 million years ago. There is compelling evidence for something else, however, and the generally accepted scientific theory for the cause of the Great Dying is that it came not hurtling out of the sky, but surging up from the core of the Earth. The Earth would have looked very different 252 million years ago. Most of the land was pressed into one giant continent that we call Pangaea, and under that continent, in a region that is present-day Siberia, was a repository of magma that created enormous volcanoes. The current consensus is that the Great Dying was caused by massive and long-lasting volcanic eruptions that led to rising temperatures across the planet. The volcanoes that created the conditions that made nearly all life unsustainable on Earth were what the scientists called the Siberian Traps. These were not the familiar cone-shaped mountains that come to mind when we think of volcanoes, or the almost majestic eruptions that we've seen in dramatic news footage. They were not like any volcanoes that humans have ever witnessed, but rather they were burning wounds in the earth on a scale that's difficult to comprehend. Fissures split the ground in networks miles long, sending plumes of volcanic gases into the atmosphere. 
The Siberian traps released gases into the Earth's atmosphere for a very long period of time. Some scientists believe the volcanic activity lasted for 300,000 years, though others believe it went on even longer. Still others contend that the volcanic activity only lasted for about 60,000 years, which is still an absurdly long time, even if it's just a blip when discussing geologic events. Whatever the actual duration, these sustained volcanic events polluted Earth's atmosphere to an extreme degree. It is believed that enormous amounts of chemicals were pumped into the air. The chemical infusion, particularly the release of immense clouds of sulfur, chlorine, and fluorine, caused acid rain, the phenomenon of ordinary rainfall becoming acidic. Some scientists believe the acid rain during the eruptions of the Siberian traps would have made rainfall as acidic as undiluted lemon juice. This would, of course, do tremendous damage to plant life. Compounding the problem for plants, clouds of volcanic ash would soon have blocked out the sun. With photosynthesis unable to occur, plant life would have taken a devastating hit as plants died and the animals that depended on them would have also perished. In yet another disaster to throw into the mix, it is believed that gases released into the atmosphere by the volcanic activity did enormous damage to the planet's ozone layer. That oh, would have caused temperatures on Earth to rise. It is possible that average temperatures across the planet rose by as much as 10 degrees Celsius. That would have raised the temperature of the seas, and it's estimated that oceans would have lost about 80% of their oxygen. With the oceans turned into massive dead zones unable to support life, the entire food chain of the planet was put in peril. These cascading factors, triggered by the massive volcanic eruptions, caused Earth to lose more than 90% of its life. Now, before we continue today, I've got to tell you about a service you've probably never heard of before. No, I'm just joking. You've definitely heard of it. It's Squarespace. Look, Squarespace is the best place to build a website in 2022. If you're thinking about doing it somewhere else, just stop. Just go to Squarespace and get started. And why should you do that? Because websites are ridiculously easy to make and feature rich with Squarespace. Imagine this situation. You know nothing about websites, but you need a website and you've seen beautiful websites out there on the internet. Well, all you got to do is go over to Squarespace and they will allow you to build something like that. And you don't need any skills. You don't need to know code. You don't need to know design. What you do is you pick a template, you customize it a little bit with your own text and your own pictures, and then boom, you are up and running. They even let you get the domain so you can have your own .com or .whatever. And I've also got loads of other features, email campaigns, analytics, social integrations, all of the usual stuff you'd expect from any good website builder. So just go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash geographics and you'll get 10% off your first purchase for a website or a domain. And now back to today's video. So how do we know when this happened? To begin to contemplate the answer to that question, we first need to contemplate the enormous span of time involved. How can we even comprehend 252 million years? Our clocks and calendars can't handle that vast expanse of time. We need to think about the geologic time scale. The idea of computing time via geology of rocks goes back a few hundred years. Scholars had been studying rocks unearthed by miners, and it became apparent that layers of rock had been deposited during distinct time periods. The study of these layers, the strata, is known as stratigraphy. The man often credited as the father of stratigraphy was a British geologist named William Smith. He was employed in the late 1700s and early 1800s by companies building canals throughout England. His work required him to analyze the rock, which would have to be cut through in order to dig the canals. Years of traveling about and looking at a vast amount of rock taught Smith that layers of rock could be identified by the fossils found in them. Strata found in different locations, if they contained the same fossils, must date to the same period. He spent 15 years distilling his hard-earned knowledge into an astounding project, his geological map of Britain, which he published in 1815. Smith's map was detailed, colorful, and quite beautiful in its own peculiar way, and it attracted a lot of attention. Smith had been doing very practical work, building canals that were the highways of the Industrial Revolution, and he intended his map to be an aid to industry by helping to determine where raw materials might be mined. The amazing geological map, as well as Smith's concept of using fossils to date layers of rock, impressed the 19th century gentlemen scholars who were attempting to make sense of ancient life. One such scientist, always a geologist born in Scotland, named Roderick Murchison. He praised Smith's map and ideas, which influenced his own work studying fossils. Murchison, who would eventually become the director of the British Geological Survey, plays a role in our story today as he became instrumental in naming the Permian Age, the period of Earth's history just before the Great Dying. The name 
Permian derives from Perm, an area of the Ural Mountains in Russia. Murchison and other geologists explored there in the early 1840s. Their study of fossils found in the rock layers of Perm enabled them to date the material relative to other layers of rock. Murchison determined the Permian rock dated to the end of the Paleozoic era. It was thus followed by the Triassic, the beginning period of the Mesozoic era. Thus, the Great Dying is said to have marked the Permian-Triassic boundary. The Great Dying is not meaningful only because it was a disaster of enormous magnitude. The slow recovery from it marked a true turning point in Earth's story. The end of the Permian period also marks the end of the Paleozoic era, the long stretch of time when plants and animals had been diversifying. In the strata, there can be found a boundary line with new fossils above the Permian layer. And then in a higher layer are the remains from the Mesozoic era when life recovered and began to flourish again. It is truly impressive that geologists in the 1800s embarked on fossil digging expeditions and by exchanging letters with each other and publishing papers created a system of geologic time which is still the basis for how we think about the deep past. However, Smith and Murchison and their contemporaries didn't really have a handle on exactly how many years were involved. They were thinking about millions of years. But how many millions was utterly unclear. Was it a few million or was it hundreds of millions? Over the past century, the discovery and refinement of radiocarbon dating has given us some clarity. And we now know the Permian is considered to have lasted from about 299 million to 252 million years ago. And by studying the fossils found in the layers of rock known to be from the Permian, uh, we can determine how much life on Earth evolved through those roughly 50 million years. We tend to care about endangered animals, especially if the animals facing extinction are things we can relate to. And let's be honest, we worry about the cute animals. Pandas, hedgehogs, and even baby rhinos get sympathy. And yet there are some animals which may not be classically cute, but we still respect them and we don't want to see them disappear. Sea turtles, bison, elephants, gorillas, tigers, eagles, and so on. But what was living in the Permian period that might have evoked some of our emotional energy? Well, there were no animals we would consider cute and cuddly. The mammals, anything warm and fuzzy, would not begin to appear on Earth for at least another 70 million years. At least you don't need to worry about adorable little hedgehogs and pandas struggling for air in the toxic smoke and acid rain. Many of the life forms that didn't survive were in the sea, including some forms of coral. One remarkable oceanic animal that didn't make it through the Great Dying was the Helicoprion, which looked like a shark that wasn't properly assembled. The Helicoprion's distinctive feature was its jaw, which resembled a buzzsaw. The vertical structure in the middle of its enormous mouth was lined with large teeth, and it could slice its prey in half with one bite. Given the Helicoprion's size up to 8 meters in length, it must have been an absolutely formidable predator. A lot of land animals that roamed during the Paleozoic would also look fairly unfamiliar to us. There is, however, one notable example. If you played with plastic dinosaurs as a child, you probably remember handling one that looked a bit like a lizard with a big sail on its back. That would be a Dimetrodon. Dimetrodon was not even a dinosaur, despite generations of toy makers lumping them in with proper dinosaurs like Triceratops and Brontosaurus. Dimetrodons lived on land more than 270 million years ago, long before the dinosaurs appeared. Dimetrodon was an example of a synapsid. Synapsids are terrestrial vertebrates. They are a large group of animals, and in fact, you and I are synapsids, as are all mammals. Remember, the mammals would not come along until a very long time after the Great Dying. But before the Great Dying, there existed the non-mammalian synapsids. During the Permian period, terrestrial vertebrates of the Palcosaur family, such as the Dimetrodon, faded away. Their evolutionary successors were the Therapsids, which included two well-known groups of creatures, the Gorgonopsids and the Cynodonts. The Gorgonopsids were fearsome beasts. Some of them were larger than our present-day grizzly bears. They were saber-toothed carnivores that walked on four feet. Some of them had long legs, which presumably made them fast and deadly hunters. The Gorgonopsids would have been the top predators on Earth at the time, feasting on other animals. They flourished during the Permian Age, but they did not survive the Great Dying. Their fossilized remains are found in layers known to be from before the extinction events, such as in the Karoo Desert of South Africa. The Cynodonts were a group of pre-mammalian animals that to our eyes might seem like a bizarre cross between a bear and a lizard. More precisely, their heads had characteristics that would later be found in mammals, yet their bodies seemed reptilian. The Cynodonts were a varied group, with some of them being quite small, and that could be why some of the Cynodonts survived the Great Dying and went on to evolve. They became part of the 
progression that many millions of years later led to the rise of mammals. Those peculiar animals, the size of rodents, were better equipped to survive the chaos on Earth during the horrendous eruptions of the volcanoes. They could survive on less food, and they could burrow and hide. The larger animals, some with big skulls with ornamented horns, died out. Being large and flamboyant was no advantage during Earth's greatest disaster. Today, scientists point to what's known as the Lilliput effect to explain what may have happened. The phenomenon is named for the fictional land of Lilliput, the island inhabited by tiny people in Gulliver's Travels. The principle of the Lilliput effect is that the animals that survive a mass extinction event have a marked decrease in body size. A compelling piece of evidence for this is that databases of fossils from the end of the Permian and the beginning of the following Triassic period show that larger animals died out. A large body was a disadvantage, the small survived. Of the cynodonts that survived the Great Dying, a fascinating one is a small animal about the size of a cat called a Thrinaxodon. The little Thrinaxodon is thought to have lived in burrows. Its affinity for life underground may have helped it survive through the bleak periods when the earth was dark and smoky. As the Earth slowly recovered from the severe extinction event, it was Thrinaxodon and other small animals that survived into the beginning of the Triassic period. By toughing it out, hiding in burrows, and not needing much food to sustain itself, scrappy little Thrinaxodons helped to ensure the future of life on Earth. Another survivor of the late Permian period was the Lystrosaurus, an ugly beast about the size of a pig. A Lystrosaurus had two long, saber-like teeth and a horned beak similar to that of a turtle. The Lystrosaurus may have survived the Great Dying because of its ability to dig burrows. Its name means shovel lizards and enter into a state similar to hibernation, thus requiring less oxygen to survive. However, it managed to adapt and survive. It flourished. Afterwards, it spread across Pangaea before the continents drifted apart, and its bones have been found in Africa, India, and Antarctica. Bones of Lystrosaurus are extremely common in fossil beds to the point where paleontologists become frustrated at finding yet another one. It is perhaps appropriate to pause for a moment and have a thought for the vast numbers of animals that were not able to adapt and survive. Had a fearsome animal like the Gorgonopsid survived, how might life have developed differently? There are apsids that roamed across Pangaea during the Permian with bizarrely horned heads for the most part did not continue to evolve. Had they survived, would their descendants be living among us today? Would they have outcompeted us? Would we not be around today? Maybe, maybe not, but it's fascinating to consider how different life on Earth might have been if some of the peculiar beasts of the Permian had not been, quite literally, stopped in their tracks. It took many millions of years, but those survivors of the Great Dying would evolve into reptiles and mammals and give the Earth the age of the dinosaurs. And of course, it would lead to a time when mammals such as ourselves would become the dominant life forms. The saga of the most devastating extinction events in the very long history of Earth is a fascinating tale. It helps us understand how life evolved, and it makes us consider how fragile life on Earth really is. It also holds extra significance today, as the idea of a warming planet is very much on the minds of people in the modern era. And as mentioned earlier, there are people who contend that we are in the middle of a sixth mass extinction event right now. Does the Great Dying really hold lessons for us today? There's certainly no expectation that the events that brought about the extinction drama for many millions of years ago will ever be repeated. We do not have one massive continent with a concentration of magma under it. Let's hope we're not jinxing anything by declaring that gigantic cracks are not going to open in the Earth and spew out plumes of toxic gases anytime soon. However, we do know that the planet has been damaged by the actions of mankind. Climate change is happening, and the news is regularly filled with reports of severe weather events from massive tropical storms, to severe droughts, to shockingly intense heat waves. If we are in the midst of an ongoing extinction event, it will play out very differently than what happened across Earth 252 million years ago. Perhaps the lesson of the Great Dying is simply to remember that life on Earth is not a sure thing. Things can happen to endanger it, and we are better off knowing that.